Hey guys, here we are for chapter four. We're gonna dive right into section one, ecosystems. Everything is connected. Your essential question for today, I want you to describe how a population differs from a species. First key term right off the bat, defining an ecosystem. And the first word is vocab word, ecosystem. They're communities of organisms and their abiotic environment. So it's the organisms, everything in an environment. Now an environment can be an oak forest, could be a coral reef, could be your backyard. A environment or ecosystems can be kind of small, they can be very big. Ecosystems also don't have clear boundaries. We talk about there's the ecosystem of the woods near Devil's Mill Hopper or wherever you might be. And we talk about there's a river ecosystem here. And, well, the boundaries are not always clear. We can definitely say, okay, I'm in the woods. We can say, I'm in a field. But then there are these ecotomes, these areas on the in between. So, and things move between one ecosystem into another. Even like pollen. Pollen can blow from one area, clear across a couple of ecosystems, and land somewhere else. Soil can wash away from a field or up in a mountain down into a lake miles and miles away. Birds will migrate from state to state, and they may eat something here, and then they may poop the seed out somewhere else. So these ecosystems wind up being interconnected because even though we can talk about this ecosystem, this ecosystem, this ecosystem, things do get shared in between them. I'm going to throw a picture up here. We're going to look at just a very basic organization pattern, if you will, in an ecosystem. So I can look at the entire biosphere, the globe, kind of small, and if I want to look at one little area, in this case I happen to be looking at a savanna in Africa, well, that's going to be my ecosystem there. And that's going to include the land, the water, the plants, the animals, the whole kid and caboodle, the air, how warm it is, everything. From that, I can talk about a community. Now the community, we're pretty much talking about the different animals that live there together. So I might have rhinoceros and lions and wildebeest and elephants, giraffes. That's the community of organisms. Then I could talk about a population of wildebeest. And I'm talking about all the wildebeest. So it might be 50, 60, 100 wildebeest. Who knows in that particular ecosystem. Or I could talk about an individual organism, a singular wildebeest out of that population, which was out of that community, which was part of a greater ecosystem, which is part of the larger entire biosphere. One way to look at this organization. The components of an ecosystem. In order to survive, ecosystems need certain basic components. You have to have energy. Normally that's going to start from the sun but anything must have energy, the mineral nutrients that make it up, water, oxygen, and living organisms. We need all of this to survive. Now, plants and rocks are the components of the land ecosystems, and most of the energy comes from the sun. Now, if one part of the ecosystem changes or is destroyed, the entire system gets affected. Uh, any part of it that changes will drive changes in everything else. Within this ecosystem we will have biotic and abiotic factors. Biotic factors. Biotic factors are environmental factors that are associated with or are the result of activities of living organisms. So plants, animals, biotic factor. A dead twig on the ground, a biotic factor. Wait, a poop from a dog, biotic factor. If it has to do with the living, it's biotic. Abiotic are the environmental factors 
not associated with living organisms. Mainly, this is going to be the air, water, rocks, and temperature, and where all minerals come into that. Those are kind of our big four, air, water, rocks, and temperature, the big abiotic factors. We can organize living and non-living things into various levels. Organisms. Organisms are just the living things that carry out life processes independently. They don't require something else to be able to go through their life. They require food or energy, but I think you get the idea. I can go all on about my life regardless of other people, individuals. You are an organism. An ant is an organism. An ivy plant is an organism. A tree is an organism. So are the bacteria that are inside of your system because a single bacteria is going around eating its food, living its life. And every organism is a member of a species. A species is just a group of organisms that are very closely related. They can mate with each other, have sex of some shape, form, or fashion, and produce fertile offspring. That last part is key. If it's a species, if two different species mate together, and produce an offspring, and it that offspring can produce, then that is a species. But we have a lot of examples of animals that can mate. They are closely related enough that they can copulate and produce an offspring, but the offspring is sterile. Let's look at a few examples. This is a liger. It is the product of a lion and a tiger. Now, obviously, lions and tigers are very similar creatures. Both cats, same size, but different colorings and some other unique differences. But in zoos, rarely do they meet in the wild, but in zoos, they've made it together and they produce a liger. The liger, however, is a sterile organism. It cannot make. It can have sex, if you will, but it, it is born sterile. So it is not its own species. It's an organism, it's alive, but we do not have a species set for it, a genus and species, because it is a sterile organism. Let's look at a few other classic examples. The mule, the mule offspring of a donkey and a horse. We've used mules forever in farms, it seems like, but they're sterile organisms. They cannot mate and reproduce another mule. The only way to get a mule is you have to cross a horse and a donkey. We have the zorse, down at the bottom, cross between a zebra and a horse. Once again, the ones on the closest to me side, these are some odd exceptions. On the top is a growler bear cross between a grizzly and a polar bear. It used to be these never met in the wild, but with climate change, polar bears are moving farther south and grizzly bears are moving farther north. But in fact, a growler bear should actually be its own species because a growler bear and a growler bear can produce another growler bear. The one at the very bottom is a geep cross between a goat and a sheep. This should not exist. Scientists for decades said, no, can't happen. The chromosomes are wrong. They can't line up. But it's a one in a million. Every now and again, we do get a geek. Now, they're usually born with problems. They don't live as long as a normal uh, animal would. However, mystery of nature. Every now and again, even though it shouldn't happen, it does. But for it to be a species, they have to be able to mate together, produce offspring that itself can mate and produce offspring. Taking us to populations. So we looked at an organism, or we look at a population. Members of a species may not necessarily all live in the same place. So if we're talking about the species of human beings, well, we're all over the planet. If we talk about the species of warbler, they're all over the place. However, when we talk about a population, a population have to be of the same species in the same place at the same time. It's my definition of population. 
same species, same place, same time. Now the textbook definition is something like same species living in the same geographical area that can interbreed. Lovely, wonderful definition. I need something simple to remember. Same species, same place, same time. Here's the deal. If it's going to be in this same population, they have to be able to breed with each other. So they have to be at the same time. I can't have a population of mice at Buholtz now and talk about it in the same population of when Buholtz opened in the 70s. They can't interbreed. A mouse alive today can't interbreed with a mouse from 1970, long since dead. Here's the thing. Let's say I have field mice out in a cornfield somewhere. Well, who are those mice having sex with? Yeah, mice in that field, by and large. They're not hiking across town, going into the city and having sex with city mice and then coming back to the field. In Florida, who do Florida people have sex with? By and large, people in Florida. In here in Gainesville, people are typically having sex with people in Gainesville. Yes, we can travel and go somewhere, but it's unusual. For the most part, a population, we talk about the people here. So we can talk a population of Gainesville today. We can talk about the population of Gainesville in 1900. We can talk about the population in Gainesville. We can talk about the population in Jacksonville. For the most part, we're separate. And this is how we identify populations. Same species, same place, same time. They have to be able to interbreed, interact. Flowers tend to pollinate other flowers nearby. There's always the exception of the bee carries it into another ecosystem, and this does occur. But this is why we tend to talk about populations here and here and here. It always gets messy when you look too close. Talking about broad categories. Communities. These are groups of various species that live in the same habitat and they do interact with each other. Now they're not interbreeding, but they do interact in some way. They have some sort of symbiotic relationship. They're working together or at least not trying to kill each other, unless they're predator-prey relationships. Every population is part of a broader community, some shape, form, or fashion. The most obvious difference between communities is the types of species. Land communities. These tend to be dominated by a particular set of plants. The type of plants that grow in the deciduous forest are different from the plants that grow in the grasslands. The plants that grow in the grasslands are different from the rainforest. The plants in the rainforest are different from the savanna. So land species tend to be dominated by a few types of plants. You know, a few might be a hundred, but these plants then determine what else can live in that community. Because things come in to eat whatever the plants are or the fruit produced by the plants and things come in to eat the things that eat the plants, etc. But the plants wind up dictating or dominating the communities. Then we come to our habitat. So we start at small and we're moving out. This is where an organism usually lives. Habitats, habitat, ecosystem, we're getting really close, but a habitat, we can be talking about a niche within an ecosystem. So every habitat has some specific characteristics that the organisms there need to survive. If any of those needs change, the habitat changes. If a bird is after a particular type of flower and that flower dies off, the bird will leave. And then the things that ate the bird will leave as well and the habitat changes. So one small change can drastically affect a habitat. The spring comes sooner and we start to get more pollen in. Things come in for it. It just makes a difference. Most organisms tend to be very well suited to their natural habitat. And as a general rule, animals and plants can't survive long periods away from their natural habitat. I can take a tree frog and carry it into a desert area, but it's not going to live long. It needs more cool and moisture that's there. I can take an animal that's, uh, I can take the Arctic fox and bring it down south, but its white fur makes it stick out and it can't catch prey 
and it becomes prey to other larger organisms because it can't hide and blend in. So organisms tend to live only within their habitat. Now there might be the same habitat in many places, but I can't really take an animal from the savanna and stick it in the deciduous forest and it survived very well for very long. Once again, as a general rule. That is it for this chapter. Well, not this chapter, but this section. Join me next time when we talk about evolution.